This is a bit of a combination, I guess, vlog and also will be a session on Silent Legions, mostly on Silent Legions and uh, bringing in some other stuff that I'll show in a minute. Basically, I, I wanted to do something not fantasy because I've been doing a bunch of fantasy stuff and I definitely wanted to do the Lovecraft kind of thing. I also wanted to do a new system, something I've been spending a lot of time with the 70s and 80s material, which is great. And if you watch my channel, you know how much I love that. But I wanted to do a, a new system, newly written and also new to me. So this is something I just bought. It's like brand new. Um, I bought it. It's a, it's a print on demand book and it was a Kickstarter, I think, 2015. Here are the credits. You can see them. And um, I chose it because, well, I chose it for a couple of reasons. One, as I said, I wanted to do something Lovecraft and I wanted to stay away from like Call of Cthulhu or something where, which I have some familiarity with. I've played the, uh, I know there's a couple of solo modules. I've only played one of them. Um, there's a lot of content, obviously, that's I think in its seventh edition now. There's a ton of content out there for that. I wanted to stay away from something with so much content because that is something that can stop me up. You know, I start to download a million things and buy a million books. So I wanted to stick to something that was more self-contained. That's number one. Number two, I have, um, if you watched, if you watch my channel at all, consistently, you've seen that I've been doing another sort of series-ish, not on RPGs, but on dead, what I'm calling dead CCGs. And I did um, Mythos, and I have all these cards from this game, and I'm thinking there's ally cards. These are all location cards. There's just a ton of location cards. And I was thinking, I don't know, maybe somehow I could use some of these cards, this material, uh, I've got spells here, there are, um, here are some tomes. I don't know how I'm going to be able to use this, or, or whoops, even if I'm going to be able to use it, but that was another reason for choosing a Lovecraft thing, because I wanted to bring this in. And then, of course, I've got the um, source material. This is, if you don't know of this book, it's worth checking out if you're serious about Lovecraft. This is the annotated um, Lovecraft, and it has the the stories, oh here I open to the color out of space, as well as annotations, description, background, commentary, really fantastic, fantastic, massive book. So I've got this. I don't know whether this is going to come into play directly in my video. I'm just at this starting point here, but I thought I would talk a little bit about the decisions that go into even choosing what I'm going to do. And I also have, and I'm sure somehow I'm going to bring in one of my absolute favorite books. This has nothing to do with gaming. This is A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander, and it is is a, a part of a series of amazing books that he did in, um, I guess we'll call it architectural urban history. And I'm going to be using this to do some random roles on um, basically um, make it a D1000 or whatever to flesh out some of the overland adventures that I'm going to be having when I put this together. I'm just starting to think right now in the meta of, of what I'm doing and what I started to do is basically look through, as I said, this is not a familiar system to me and when I approach something new what I do for the most part initially is I skip over usually what comes at the beginning, which is like character creation or whatever. And I go to, and here it's divided up, character creation, rules of the game, and then some various aspects of the game. I go to what looks like the broadest um, chapter or rule set. In this case, it's quite clear here, building your world or maybe creating your mythos. Um, because I want to see what types of material I'm going to have to create my rubric. And that's going to start to generate for me some of the bigger picture ideas about um, what I'm doing. And I start to make notes on that um, to see, you know, in some way what 
um, where I'm going with it. So I've got here, there are uh, rules here in the back that are directed toward the GM for uh, university setting, which I'm definitely going to do. I love a university setting. I have spent some of my career in a university setting and um, at heart, you know, I'm always kind of in an English department. So definitely going to do that. And I'm going to start there somehow. And then I was thinking about ways to branch off, maybe can do my little adventure in three chapters. I want this to be book oriented for obvious reasons and keep it that way in my mind in terms of what I'm doing with having a beginning, a middle, and an end. So I want a starting place. I want an ending place. And um, then the question is, are we going to have, you know, are we going to be leaving the university, having some type of outdoor travel here. Maybe I'm going to do indoor underground travel, but again, I want to get away from the kind of fantasy dungeon crawl-ish setting. Even if I make it catacombs under the university, I feel like I've done that a bit. I want to be outside. I really want to bring in um, one of my favorite books and one of my favorite source materials. So uh, something's going to be happening outside. And then, of course, I don't know, something I don't know. Um, I noticed when I was going through my my mythos game, there's a bunch of cards that are water related, dock related. Maybe there could be, maybe I could get somewhere to something with water. That's not something that I tend to do in um, my RPGing. I'd like to incorporate that. I don't, I don't really know. And then after I look at the broader setting here, and you can see I've got some notes up here for, I'm going to do a dungeon world thing, I think at some point, but not now. Um, I was looking at the uh, classes of characters and they're definitely going to be a scholar. I'm going to take a scholar and a socialite for sure. And, um, you know, there's an investigator and a tough guy. I feel like I need need one of those, but I'm not so into that. I'm really into the scholar and the socialite. So maybe the scholar and the socialite are going to go out and ultimately need to meet up with the rest of their party or one other person who will form a party. I don't yet know. I haven't gotten into the system enough. But these are some of the bigger picture decisions that I make the way I approach, in this case, a totally new system to me, looking at what are the biggest structure things that I'm getting. Um, in this case, the book is coming with GM material as well as player material, which is perfect. So I'm looking first at the GM material to help inform a kind of structure for me. And then I'm going to, from, from that, decide um, the contours of my overall adventure you know, how it's going to begin, how it will end, if I can do that in terms of the structure, obviously not in terms of what happens. But in this case, I know I want three distinct chapters. I want to be uh, starting in a university in an English department, and I want to be going outside. So I know that already. And um, now I'm going to set forth with just that amount of information uh, and start to create some characters. Rolled up my characters, and well, I'll show you that in a minute. I'm not going to go through the, all the rules here. I don't, I don't know whether there are other videos online that do that, but that's not really my purpose here. I will just tell you some basics in case you're not familiar with the system. Um, there are six central attributes that you can choose from. It's a 3d6 roll, and then you get modifiers based on what you get. There are um, some rules here for either taking a standard number or doing it randomly. What I did was I rolled my um, I rolled my 3d6s six times, and then I got numbers and values and assigned it as I wish. So it's sort of a combination of things. This is my my scholar here. His name is Mr. Charles, and he has um, eight strength, 14 dexterity. I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, I've got the modifiers here. Unfortunately, he only ended up with two health. In fact, they both ended up just with two health, which was a bummer. You get quite a lot of skills that you have um, as potential skills, but you don't have access to them until you level up. And of course, I wanted to know, well, how do I level up? And I looked, and this is just a real uh, sort of editorial side note here. This index is terrible. And first of all, you can tell the index is terrible when you just see it, because look how short it is. And there's no, like, you look up, for example, leveling up. Well, that would be something in an index. Leveling up is not here. Uh, you know, it costs, I don't know, 750 bucks or something to get a professional index done for a book of this length. So I really would encourage people to do that when they're 
spending so much effort obviously on the game it's kind of a bummer to have um, an index that doesn't work all right I am detouring now into healing here because I did not uh, look at that myself and with only two health I'm a little bit worried about that so uh, let's see Failed saves leaves you incapacitated for 2d6 days. Well, I need to figure out how I'm going to use this. And this is part of what happens when I work with something, particularly something new, because obviously I need to have a healing mechanism, especially with only two health. But I'm not likely going to be measuring in days. Or if I measure in days, I need to come up with some indication of what has caused a day to pass and that's always a little tricky for me when I'm doing this solo. Um, the experience I think also has to do with days passing here so I'm going to need to work on that but let me go back to the character attributes. So you have access to a lot of things. You get to um, choose a background for your character. I didn't do it randomly. I made my um, I made my scholar an antiquarian background and then it gives him some starting skills, some of which actually overlapped with what he already had for being a scholar. And I made my socialite a bodyguard background. Uh, this is going to give her some combat skills because I did not have combat skills. And as I mentioned, I'm viewing this as a couple of characters that are going to meet up with another character. And when um, we look here at some of the skills, they are explained here pretty basically and um, in a nice way that gives you enough contours for some flexibility as you move forward. And then you get pages of what your basic um, class is. Now, I did not choose the investigator class. I chose here the scholar and I chose the socialite. And so with the class, you get some prime attributes that will be um, one that you can choose to assign a very a higher value to and um, then some class skills we just saw what those were and then some bonus skills you have certain abilities that you can use by spending uh, I think it's called an expertise dice I can't remember what that is but these are uh, coming in at various levels so you don't have access to all of them and you have to choose to spend a um, one of your expertise points not a dice point to enact that and then there are some saving throw values that you get and there's a nice chart here based on the level that you are your um, hit dice really this is your strength points and as as mentioned unfortunately my socialite could have had uh, up to six health but she only rolled a two on a 1d6 and also on the um, the scholar on a 1d4 I end up with a two so that's kind of unfortunate and the other uh, potential uh, class is the tough class, which is like another, um, I guess, another, you know, fighter type, but I didn't go for that. When I am um, playing this way with multiple members of a party, oftentimes the sense that I have as I'm playing is one that is more of being an author kind of manipulating characters it's almost like a character playing game as opposed to a role playing game where I really uh, inhabit the feeling of one particular character and there are certain games that I play I should say that are RPG-ish where I will play a party and still really identify with the individuals in the party. Uh, for some reason, I play Citadel of Blood kind of much similarly to the way that I was showing you uh, Valkenburg Castle, and there I play a party, but I get more identification. If I do a James Bond RPG, definitely more identification there. I don't know if it's the source material or what, but somehow here I'm, even as I talked earlier, thinking of this as being chapters. I'm feeling a little distance, not in a bad way, but just in a different kind of way, a little distance from the material so that it is like I'm more moving characters around as opposed to being in the role. But be that as it may, it also could be because I'm filming it and uh, filming it and talking about my thoughts behind it is, you know, in some way distancing to, again, not in a bad way, but just uh, to mention that. So back to Mr. Charles, the scholar, um, I have made him a, he, uh, his, he has an art skill as a writer. There's one thing I really liked about this, which is that under the skills, there are certain skills where you need to 
choose a specific, um, I don't know what he calls it, um, let's see, a specialization, right. So here under, you can see under art, uh, there's a specialization, so the character is gifted in a particular form of art, and it gives some suggestions, singers, dancers, musicians, sculptors, painters, writers, and other creative souls. I made my scholar a writer, but what's really great is that you have all of medicine here as a skill, but there is no specialization in medicine. So it says, from first aid to brain surgery, medicine covers all matters related to healing, pharmaceuticals, and human biology. So you get to really specialize in the arts and not the medicine, and I appreciated that. Um, as somebody who is, has a um, humanities background, I did appreciate that. Be that as it may, um, the scholar is in his specialization. He is a writer. He also has a profession of a literary critic. So I am, we're starting out in the English department. This is going to be his home base. I think we'll probably be starting out in or around his office. We'll see. Maybe he'll have a visit from this socialite. And the socialite is, um, as mentioned, she is um, going to be Miss DeLuna, and I don't have her first name yet. It may come to me, it may not. She is an architect, and um, yes, it seems perhaps unlikely, but she is a socialite architect who has a background in calligraphy, and um, she has some things. She's carrying a pump shotgun. We didn't go into the items, but everybody gets a certain amount to carry. There's a little ambiguity in my reading of this so far in terms of there is an encumbrance cost to certain things, but I found that to be a little ambiguous, and I'm leaving, I'm leaving a couple of slots. As you can see, I was kind of, I crossed out some things here because um, they're going to be finding some things. They're going to be picking some things up, and I need to be realistic, you know, quote-unquote realistic in the context of something totally unrealistic, uh, that they can't just carry around everything they find. So she's going to be able to carry some things, um, and so is he. I gave him a revolver and a first aid kit. I gave them both a first aid kit. I'm not even sure how the first aid kit works, to be honest. I didn't really see that in here, so I'll need to figure out uh, to what extent I need to figure that out myself. But I've got uh, I've got my characters ready to go. She she rolled up stronger numbers than he did, but the modifiers uh, we didn't really didn't get much beyond a one plus one for wisdom and intelligence. So I mentioned you have access to a lot of these potential skills, but you have zero values in them until you start to level up. So that's kind of an interesting. Uh, mechanic in a sense because I can see what I am going to be able to do better but right now I can't. I can assign some um, I don't remember what these are called but I get a modifier basically to some of them that I can use if these skills come into play but many more possibilities than I'm actually able to use. I put a question mark here because I realize you're not allowed to start at level one with more than a two value and I didn't understand something there so I need to correct that. So that's a number one and um, yeah so we're ready now to move from the characters into where I'm coming next and I think where I'm coming next I'm skipping over a lot of stuff and I'm gonna need to figure it out obviously this whole madness thing is going to be important I haven't even read those rules but I want to get into a location because that for me is where things start to happen and from there I will go back and look at the rules so it's very much a learning experience for me as I'm going when I'm starting out with a system like this that I don't know and um, I'm filming it as I go as I said as this is more of an experimental conversation on video than an actual anything else. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to look at this building your world section and start within the world very very local at the English department of the university. I'm glad I decided to make this video as a vlog because that the fact that I'm using this new system is causing me a little bit of trouble and I think it's a little bit of trouble that I have and maybe other people have at a certain point you get you get your system going and you make your characters and then blah you know then what and I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out and then what and I started initially trying to I don't like to go too quickly into like building the world because I think that can be a real dead end that you spend um, a lot of resources 
building a world out of a rule set. And part of the reason it's great to do is because typically in the um, rule set, you've got a lot of choices that you can create tables and roll on, and it's GM material, and it's, um, it's right there for you to create. But then you've got this whole world, and it kind of compounds the fact that you don't know what to do within it, at least for me. Um, I got to just speak for myself here. And I fell into that trap actually a little bit. I haven't been filming it, but I fell into that trap here because I went to uh, I went to the Building Your World section, I went to the Mythos, and um, despite the fact that I knew my starting place, I wanted it to be an English department, and I wanted my characters to start out there, I wanted some larger background, and I just kind of got stymied. I did a bunch of rolling on tables. It didn't get me anywhere, and um, I will share with you some of my notes. Well, a couple follow-ups on the um, on the characters. There's something in here I did not show you that I assigned values for. Let me find it here. Here we go. It's under um, occult disciplines, right up there. You can see it at the top, and. Um, it says a newly generated PC who is allowed to pick a discipline may spend one of their free skill picks to gain level zero mastery of it. This was not, this is under sorcery. It was not in character creation. So I decided to do that because I think it gives a little more, um, it, it, it starts to branch the character out into the world as a kind of connector bridge. So I gave my socialite, let's see here, my scholar had witch finding. I think I just rolled randomly. Um, there were eight of them, I think, and I just uh, rolled. And so my scholar ended up with witch finding. It describes this here for what it is. Um, and then I got warding for my socialite. So these are additional character traits that are going to start to reach out into that world. So I did that, but it still it still left me just a little bit confused and I thought well when I'm confused I'm going to stick an NPC in there and they're going to begin in the space that I've predetermined and they're going to talk to this NPC and I rolled up uh, somebody and um, I got I don't know I got something that ultimately I did use but I got somebody an old teacher who was past friends with somebody uh, something about owing money and blackmail wasn't really getting anywhere then I tried to say like well when I'm not getting somewhere the next thing I do is I go to the location I try to make the location um, so I write this description here the wood and glass doors to the English department swing open uh, sitting on the worn leather couch is an old friend of the scholars. For years he is protecting Mr. Charles from threats of blackmail from whom nobody knows. Um, honestly, <laughs> I wasn't really getting anywhere with it. It wasn't really resonating with me. And this is where it can become, well, first of all, for me, it can become important to remember that everything I'm doing is playing the game, even if it's some parts of it just aren't that satisfying. And the reality is, in many games, some parts of it aren't that satisfying, whether it's being bored while you're waiting for your opponent to make their turn, or a certain game mechanic you don't like, or a component of the game you don't like, or whatever. Nothing's perfect, and sometimes you run into a rough spot. So I decided to go in a little bit of a different direction. Then I started um, looking at creating um, some type of space. Again, I wasn't getting anywhere with it. But finally, finally, what I did was I went outside of the uh, system here, Silent Legions. I went to the Tome of Adventure design. Now again, we're working with a slightly, we're not working in a dungeon world, and we're not working in the pre pre precisely fantasy world. So uh, most of my resources at the moment are that. I have my architectural non-gaming resource that I showed you. That wasn't getting me anywhere. But I went to the um, classic dungeon design guide, just again, trying to figure on finding something that is going to spark my imagination. And I eventually did. And what I got was as follows. So I got, we are in the foyer of the English department. There's a fire in the corner. There's an old mirror above it. And there's the smell of pipe smoke in the air. It feels like there's a wind blowing, but there's no open door or window. There are some decorations here of mythical beasts on the walls, and um, one of them contains a spiked tail of a dragon creature, and there is a display case that shows some bloodied manacles, perhaps from this creature, we don't really know. 
the English department at this university is the home to some of the most powerful wizards around, and the specialty, the specialization of these wizards is the undead. In particular, um, then I began to investigate um, and I kept rolling on different tables. Sometimes I'll roll on different tables from different books and see um, if anything comes together. And I was getting, you know, a basic skeleton, a skeletal factor, a skeletal feature. And then I went to my another resource that can often get me out of some trouble, which is my dictionary of symbols here. And in the Dictionary of Symbols, I read about skeletal creatures and skeletons and came up with this um, idea that um, obviously they symbol death, but they also symbolize the, the remnants of the threshold, the knowledge of a threshold of the borders between life and death and uh, keeping some secrets therein. And um, I continued to read about this and the legends of what skeletons are vis-a-vis -vis the underworld. And this is now telling me that my um, characters are going to be entering this room and trying to figure out what is the source of this anomaly, this cold wind, and um, where is it going to lead them. And so I feel a little bit now unstuck and beginning to be able to move into what I'm deeming sort of my first scene of this story. I'm going to say they're in this room, they're looking around. What I know is here is a fire, and I think I said there was a fire, and there is this mirror. So Socialite with her perception possibility is going to be investigating that. And I'm going to turn to, in the uh, Silent Legions book here, this table, which comes into play quite a bit on the, uh, let's see how I can show this to you, the example skill difficulty. So it's giving you a number that you're rolling 2d6 against, and then you are going to add any attribute modifiers and relevant skill level you have. In this case, it's going to be just a nothing. And you're looking for an equal or exceeding the number difficulty. So um, for example, um, here I'm going to say that looking at this mirror and determining whether there's something unique or magical about it is going to require an expert to do. A layperson could not do that. Um, would it push the limit of what someone could do? No. So my role, my decision on this is I'm looking for an 11 on, um, again, we've got the 2d6 going here, and I need to roll an um, 11 or more to have a success on this because I have no modifiers, and I rolled an 8. So no success there. I am playing with this optional rule, this partial success rule. I like it, especially with solo play, so I don't just... Um, end up with nothing. And it is saying here that it, it gives a less binary result. So it says, if this rule is used, a skill check that misses by three points or less is a partial success. The PC may get what they want, but new complication or problem is introduced by their success, uh, or they may not get all of they want it, what they want, etc. So in this case, uh, the answer is simply that the mirror possibly um, is suggestive of something that's going to help them, but it's not clear as to what. And now what I'm going to do and what I always do is look to my characters and see what skills and assets they have that they might bring to bear on the situation. So I'm going to look at that and uh, see what I'm going to do. I'm reminded here by myself that um, in addition to this mirror here, there is um, this, um, uh, there's walls are decorated with um, these hides of these mythical beasts. There's a spiked tail here in a case, and um, there's also a display case of some bloodied manacles. And I don't have much, the scholar can't do much because his attributes, his aiding uh, skills are really more specific to being in a library, to being in a situation where um, things are more concrete, the history benefit that he has his, his skill in research and as a literary critic. However, my socialite um, also gets a culture benefit. So I am going to ask whether these um, artifacts that are on the wall that are designed and obviously placed there by somebody, do they are they likely to shed 
light on some cultural phenomenon and I'm going to go here to see whether they are and I'm going to say that they are um, they are likely to do that so let's roll and see if that is the case first of all and the answer I'm rolling a lot of sevens here so um, that yes they are but but what well let's see let's see but what but a twist to the relationship between people in the situation. Well, interesting. Now, the situation between my socialite and friend, um, or I should say, and scholar, I think there was, um, I think there was an existing relationship between the two of them, and I will need to note what that is. I'll put that up on the video because I can't remember right now, but the point is I don't want to lose my train of thought here. What I'm doing now is I'm having my socialite check to see um, if she can learn something about the culture of the environment that they're in um, by investigating the, these artifacts that are on the wall. It's the same deal in terms of the skill check. She's going to need to roll um, an 11 or better on two d6s, but she is going to get a plus one for her um, culture skill. And what did we roll? We rolled poorly. And even with a plus one, that's definitely a no. Uh, we're not getting any gradations here. So we're not learning a whole lot um, right now. And we've been spending a lot of time here in this room with not much happening. So I need to ask and figure out, is it likely that we are going to be attracting the um, ire, the notion of any beings that may be around here? And if so, what's going to happen? So I think the longer we spend, the likelier it gets. I'm going to say it's likely that we are at this point. And we'll see about that. That's a 13. Um, so we will say, yes, we are beginning to attract the um, notice of some creatures. Now, obviously, I chose to do this because, hey, not much was going on. And I think that when you are in a situation playing solo, you need to act as if you were not by yourself and think to yourself, how can I move this action along? And the first thing that comes to mind for me is bringing in some monster, bringing in some enemy where something has to happen. I mean, there are other things you can do. You can bring in an, an, an NPC can show up. Um, you can move to another place, etc. I don't want to move to another place yet, and I don't want to bring an NPC, but I did want to bring in a monster. So now here's a way to do it. And I'm going to talk about my thoughts on bringing in monsters to these settings now. What I try to avoid is to just have a monster showing up with no backstory. So I want to treat the monster as if it were part of some ongoing story. I may have limited information about it, but I am going to turn to some of the supporting material to give some background, some inkling into why this monster is here, how it came to be, etc. Because these are avenues that can be explored narratively down the road in addition to just interacting with combat with it. The connection of uh, the the skeleton to the larger mythos. I I rolled on some tables here and came up with. Uh, since the earliest ages of of humans, these monsters have been around trying to infiltrate or control humans. Uh, uh, their psychic powers are uh, where the influence is felt. So what this tells me is that there's going to be additional madness costs associated with interacting with these. And I'm going to factor that in to the combat. Actually, I've already done that. Um, so I'm just going back and showing you a little bit because it's not, uh, I'm struggling with sort of how to, how to make this of interest to those of you that are watching through with some commentary and some action as well. I rolled up my, my skeleton came from basically from the silent legions uh, had, uh, this was the, um, let's see, the, the mine, I don't know what it's called, the light, the smallest of the skeletons, basically. And um, then there were some additional types of horrors that, that could have, and I just checked in to see what they would be, and they, I got additional points, so it's ravenous and hulking. It's pretty bad, unstoppable in some way, and we are already ill-equipped to deal with it because they are resistant to any non-magical weapons, and we actually don't have any. We um, went through some 
combat. And again, we, I'm reminding myself here, we're impervious to hits from non-magical weapons. They're reckless and fearless. And um, basically what we needed to do, we did. And um, we started in with the combat, basically following the rules um, from Silent Legions. We rolled for initiative and the initiative went to the skeleton. It attempted to approach the socialite. Now I did, um, I did a just a random, uh, even odd roll, and the socialite was the one who caught the attention of the skeleton. They are in the narrow foyer and of the English department, and um, the skeleton sort of wildly attacked her but missed, and in her response, what she decided to do was to attempt to, she has a nylon rope, and she attempted to uh, use that to ward off the skeleton and to do that she rolled on an occult skill which she did not have against a level of nine which came from the the skill book here because I determined that um, not the skill book the skill chart is what it is let's just show you where that is hang on a second so here is the skill difficulty chart and my sense was that um, this is a task that would normally require an expert to do, but not really something so extraordinary that only an expert would have a real chance of accomplishing it. So I determined that for the skill check, we were on a level nine and she rolled there, even with the minus, it would have been, it was fine. So she um, rolled a 16, so she cleared that. She successfully enchanted that. And then I rolled on dexterity to see if she could lasso the skeleton and um, against the 13 because I felt that this skeleton is hard to deal with because of all the modifiers and indeed this is going to be a task that would push the limit of what a master could easily accomplish and indeed she was rolling well so we whoops losing a little here she rolled um, re she rolled against that and um, Let's see, I didn't see what I rolled, but that was a success. And she was lassoed. So this is going to give them some chance to escape. And then I did some saving throws on evasion to see whether they did escape, and they both did. So the, the um, in this brief interaction, the skeleton has been lassoed by a... Uh, nylon rope that was enchanted a bit to give them a chance to escape but because it was just a bit they had to make a saving throw it wasn't automatic they're rushing out of the foyer and now they're going to be coming outside and this is where i'm next going to turn to one of my non-game books i showed earlier in the video this pattern language to see what we might be encountering here and few points of clarification on my skeleton here, though it was weak, based on what I had rolled up about the extra horror, I believe I need to really go to 1d8 madness roll to see how my socialite and my scholar are impacted by their interaction with this with this skeleton. So I'm going to do that. So there is the scholar is going to get a plus a two madness there and the socialite also a two. All right, so I'll keep track of that. And the other point I need to mention here is that on the, um, well, two things. The, okay. The warding that I did, uh, we it was really generalized. There is um, a page here where I could have and maybe should have but didn't go through um, gathering these dice and giving a better sense of what that uh, warding that I was trying to create would actually do, what it actually do, what I wanted it to do. I glossed over that and it just did, but there's a little more detail here that you could have used. What I am going to do though, just in fairness, because this is how it plays, is that uh, there's going to be some detriment to my socialite for, or maybe both of them, for having um, attempted and in this case successfully used some magic. So we've got this page here that gives us using a handful of dice, we got a d4, d20, etc. I'll gather up here and um, roll to see what we're going to get um, as an impact for the magic that we called forth. So let's gather these things for 8, 12. What else do I need? I need a 10. 
I need a 20, of course, uh, and I'm missing a 6. All right, so we got a handful of dice. We're going to do this roll and just see what type of um, impact this is going to have on us. And uh, let's see, we rolled a 1 here. So, oh, okay, well, it's noticeable and annoying, but not debilitating. So whatever it is, it will not be so bad. And what is the effect? D20, we rolled a 12. It weakens the user against magic, forcing, saving, re-rolls. Okay, so in that case, I think what that's going to mean is that on a um, magic save, we're going to, I guess, maybe have to roll twice and take the worst uh, result, perhaps. Perhaps, I'll confirm that. We rolled a d6, we rolled a 2, and this is, it happens only rarely when the item is employed. Well, you know what, we did. How can this curse be suppressed? We rolled a 1, and a specific spell can quell or dampen the curse. Okay, what triggers the curse? d12, we also rolled a 1 on that. Activation of the item's power applies the curse. All right, so it has been applied, and the effects here, a d10, and that was our d10 roll. Meditation and undisturbed concentration erases it. Hmm. Basically what I'm getting here is, summing this all up, is we've got um, something impacting our magic save roll, and... I need to make some notes about that and sort of coalesce it into an effect. Our scholar and socialite have rushed outside, and the um, the question initially is, you know, are they leaving some information behind in the English department where they had this quick encounter? And I would say it's extremely likely that there's more to be learned there, and we'll roll on that and see that indeed... It is, yes, they are going to need to either come back there or they're not done with that foyer yet, for sure, clearly. They rush outside and we want to know what the weather is like, so we're going to determine that it is a steady rain. They're running out into a steady rain. They're looking around and what do they see? Well, I I always like to bring in some non-gaming resource to my uh, games, and it, in this case, is this book that I mentioned here, which has some cool architectural stuff. So let's just see what we get as the basis for what we're looking at here. And we are looking at page 712, and let's see what 712 brings to us. small meeting rooms. Hmm. Let's see. Well, oh, interesting, huh? Within organizations and workplaces, a university as a marketplace, local town hall, etc. The problem is we are actually going outside, so this is not going to be applicable to us. Um, but let's look to the reference here, university as a marketplace, and see if that's going to give us something. And if not, we'll re-roll. University is a marketplace of ideas, university crossroads, scattered facilities, etc. Okay, so the advice here is, um, this is again an architecture book, give the university a promenade at its central crossroads and around the crossroads cluster the buildings along streets etc and uh, we want to give this central area access to quiet greens and all sorts of housing so we're running out we are at a um, we're going to say we're at the crossroads of the university here the English department of course is going to be in the center of that and um, our scholar and our socialite in this heavy rain are going to be looking around for something sense of this location so I'm rolling on this location tag a table a d6 and a d10 and we're rolling a 1 and a 2 so what we have here is we come to bitter envy and let's see what this is describing for our location situation 
The sight is suffused with envy and a spirit of thwarted desire, whether for money, power, or respect. One group is convinced that their rightful due is being kept from them by another group. Mm -hmm. The envy may be rooted in a seed of injustice, but it has long since ballooned beyond any reasonable measure and will now be satisfied with nothing less than everything. We have some enemy suggestion here, some friends, some schemes and secrets and places. Let's see, demolished home of the envied class, grimy place of envious deprivation, lushly excessive building, a den where vengeance is plotted. Well, we are clearly in the cro at the crossroads of some warring factions in this university that are fighting each other for something, and um, we need to investigate this and see what it is that is being thwarted, what the goals are, and how we play in this larger scheme that is going on around us. I want to get some more sense of the escape situation that we just found ourselves in. We rolled an eight here. Uh, the situation suddenly flips as a seeming triumph by the heroes is rapidly inverted by the appearance of an invincible enemy or circumstance, perhaps due to some final vengeful self-sacrifice by the enemy. You know what? That skeleton, we are not done with it. It was, as we mentioned, um, extremely strong and, um, what did I say it was? It was ravenous and frenzied and it was going to be unstoppable. And indeed, this escape table has shown us that we are not safe right now. And I think we're going to need to start making some um, perhaps dexterity rolls and um, athletics rolls to see whether we are actually safe now and where we're going to go in this steady rain at the crossroads of this university setting. <laughs> As is sometimes the case, there's a moment where things start to really come together, and that's what I've got here with these location tags, because that we're at a crossroads, and there's a suggestion of four different places that could be possibilities off of these crossroads, and you can see here I've sketched this out a little bit, deciding that if there is one uh, lush building, it's going to be the English department building from which we came. This is back to the original sketch I made, and unfortunately I did not think to uh, photograph it before I drew more on it, but nevertheless, you may recall it, you can go back and look at the beginning of the video and see that uh, the outdoor travel spot, I had thought originally of three chapters for this adventure, this story, I talked about how I saw it very much in that narrative structure, and that there would be some outdoor travel to the south, of the English department, exiting the English department, there'd be some wilderness or outdoor segment, and then there would be possibly some indoor or underground travel that was represented here, sort of toward the left or the east, and then I had a question mark toward the west, and at a certain point I put in, well, maybe there's going to be something with docks, because I thought that perhaps I would be using some materials from the Mythos card game, and there were a lot of uh, cards there that had to do with water and docks, and I thought I could factor that in. I didn't end up doing that, or I should say so far I haven't ended up doing that. But now these crossroads really make a lot of sense to me because this concept of indoor underground travel really does represent probably the demolished home of the envied class that was referenced in the location tag. And then to the south, the grim place of envious deprivation. Well, that does sound like a docks area to me. And I also talked about perhaps meeting up with a tough guy in the adventure, and maybe the tough guy is on the docks. Now, you know, that's uh, pretty stere pretty stereotypical, but hey, you know, it's, um, this is horror, this is a stereotype, it has a certain kind of B-movie element to it, so I'm okay with that. And then uh, to the west here, we've got what's left, the den where vengeance is plotted, and I have a question mark here, uh, I had a question mark initially, because I'm not really sure what that represents, but now, after all this time, I feel that I have a very solid foundation, a location foundation and a conceptual foundation for where my party is, where my two people are, and the thoughts that uh, they could go in different directions and have different experiences depending on where they decide to go. Conveniently, you know, there's a, it's a crossroads, there's four places to go. I could roll a d4 to see randomly where they go, I could make a decision as to what makes sense for them to do. I don't really want to go back right now to the English department because um, 
We've been there in the foyer. We've established that there is more there to be learned. Certainly the home of the wizard scholars is something that could be a very rich exploration and series of encounters, but I don't want to do that right now. So basically we're looking at a D3 roll if I want to randomize it as to where we would go. Um, or I could just make a decision. I could decide uh, simply as if I were a GM telling people what was open to them, or I could parse it out using any number of supporting uh, material that I have that would allow me to do that. Such are the options open to the solo GM, and such is where we have arrived and where I think I'm probably going to leave this video entry because the video itself is getting long, and I think I've shown how uh, I start to construct something and really the transformation not only of nothing into this type of story and narrative, but also my own experience where I initially I felt and talked about the probability that I would be um, somewhat removed from this adventure and looking at it on the outside. And now I feel a little differently about it. I mean, it's hard because I'm still filming and that's part of the reason why I think I'm going to stop filming. But um, I do feel more of a sense now within these characters as a set as to what they're going to do. Maybe um, maybe the socialite's going to try to persuade the scholar to do something. Maybe she has some desires that is not are not shared by him. I don't know. But that is um, what I will continue to explore off camera. Hope this has given you some um, interesting or at least useful insights into some of the process that I go through when I create a story like this for myself.